First, a caveat. Um, as a member of the executive branch, I do not endorse recommendations for executive branch or legislative branch action. Um, and so I take no opinion on this report. Um, but what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about some of the good data practices that um, Jim mentioned uh, and talk about kind of implementation aspects of it and some other um, the thoughts from our from our previous panelists to kind of maybe tie wrap things up a little bit. Um, the report focuses on, as, as Jim said, good data practices and specifically on focusing on the fair information practice principles. The FIPS, as they're called, are um, uh, you know shadowed in the Privacy Act of uh, of 1974, Bob, and uh, and are really the cornerstone of good privacy practices and good uh, data practices in the government. And I think that that's a really important place to start. And I think it's it's one that uh, we should really make sure that the FIPS are indeed incorporated into data mining programs. And I think that that is um, an important element to think about when you're looking at programs that deal with, with data mining. The, um, uh, the, the Department of Homeland Security's Privacy Impact Assessments and its data mining report really have tried to incorporate those and embed them, both in terms of the development of programs as well as the um, implementation of those programs and the reviews and, and confirmation of the, the elements in terms of periodically uh, confirming that the, the privacy principles that you've laid out in the, in the impact assessments or the data mining report are indeed uh, continue to be effective and efficient and necessary. Um, and, and so I think that's an important element to think. Uh, another theme that goes throughout this report is transparency and disclosure. And I think that that, as, as Sharon mentioned, I am also the chief FOIA officer. And so those two elements, privacy and freedom of information, are very important ones to weave together. And um, I think that that is uh, a great uh, element for people to try to work on and to work on improving. Um, the uh, one of the uh, things discussed in here is to talk about uh, access to information and amendments to information. And um, the DHS is currently working on um, having a more um, centralized and robust amendment process. We actually don't get that many amendments for, for, for requests for personal information. DHS is the leader in Freedom of Information Act requests, uh, having received 130,000 last year. Um, uh, which was about a 30% increase, um, and it was about uh, about 70% of those are personal requests, re requests for your personal records, primarily in the immigration space. Um, uh, you know, in terms of accessing their alien file or other immigration elements, but we certainly get requests for any type of border crossing information, passenger name records, and so on. Um, uh, we do have an amendment process. It's of course uh, required by the Privacy Act. But I think that having this kind of centralized look and correction is an important element that we had already been looking at in terms of reviewing. I then wanted to talk about a couple of DHS programs that um, one that data mines and one that doesn't data mine um, to, to kind of tease out some of the recommendations in here. In terms of um, programs that DHS data mines. Now, the, the Constitution Project obviously has their definition, which is the footnote on page one. The federal definition, which I don't think you actually repeated in the report, or maybe it was in the footnotes, is just a um, program involving pattern-based queries. We heard Jim talk about that. Pattern-based queries, searches, or other analyses of one or more electronic database where the federal government um, attempts to discover or locate a predictive pattern or anomaly indicative of terrorist or criminal activity. It's kind of uh, thereafter. It's 42 U.S.C. 2000 EE 3B1. <laughs> but um, but I just wanted to, to tease that out. So the definition is narrower than the one the definition in the report. Um, with regard to DHS, we have three programs that fall into that definition. Um, there are three programs in our 2009 report that came out in 2009. And there are the same three programs uh, with a slight update on the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Program, but doesn't really affect the data mining element um, for our 2010 report, which is currently in interagency review. So hopefully it'll be out um, in December. Um, the One of the programs that we use is one that uses passenger name records, and Paul kind of obliquely alluded to it, but may have conflated it with 
other elements. Passenger name records is a program that Customs and Border Protection, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a data field that Customs and Border Protection uses in its automated targeting system, ATS. And that's one of the three elements where we have, um, where we do uh, use data money under the current de uh, federal definition. The ATS process um, is one where uh, they're looking for these patterns or predictive behaviors associated with terrorists and criminal activities, consistent with CBP's authorities to control who comes into our, um, uh, into our, uh, our border. And they um, do this first through kind of what we would call data mining and, and looking for these anomalistic behaviors. But then there's always human intervention. There's always someone looking at it and saying, does this make sense? Is this something, you know, this person flies from Miami to Bogota every Monday with no luggage and flies from Bogota to Miami every Tuesday with luggage. Pretty simplistic example, but that would be one of maybe we should take a look at that person <laughs> and see if indeed are they uh, a, a, uh, a business person or are they somebody who may be engaged in drug trafficking. Um, but it would be somebody who's making the decision. Then they, they go, nope, we know Sharon does that every Monday and comes back every Tuesday because she deals in emeralds or she is moving from Miami, from Bogota to Miami, um, which, good, thank you, good for doing that. Um, <laughs> but so those would be the types of things. You've always got, a, a, you've got actually uh, not only human intervention, but a couple of levels of human intervention in order to do what Paul talked about, which is to try to, to uh, have as, what did he say? He said, as many people who are not terrorists and not criminals to allow them to go through in a fair and effective way while looking at the people who may or may not be criminals and may or may not be terrorists to, to try to uh, marshal our resources and use them appropriately. And I think that the human inter intervention piece is an important one and also kind of permeates throughout this, um, uh, throughout this report. An area where uh, DHS has made an express decision to not data mine is in secure flight, which is run by uh, uh, Transportation Security Administration that Paul referred to earlier. So secure flight is a very narrow program which only matches names. It only looks for people who have exact name matches on the watch list. It does not data mine. If you look at, I think, the footnote 64 or 65, gives a little more detail on that and gives a citation to the Secure Flight Privacy Impact Assessment as well. And um, in that circumstance, we're not looking for predictive behaviors. We're not looking for patterns. And quite frankly, I think it would be information overload to even try to do that. Um, but in that circumstance, uh, it's a different mission, a different space, and is not indeed um, employing data mining. And then just to distinguish, body scanners and pat downs although we can have that conversation, I'm happy to have that conversation today, is not data mining. <laughs> In fact, there's no data collected by Transportation right. Security Administration. And again, we can have that conversation um, uh, later. But I think that the, the elements of uh, making sure that the, that the privacy assessments are, are uh, the good data practices that permeate throughout are incorporated into the conversation and incorporated into the development of these programs are a very important one and one that is, is uh, important to consider to make sure that you are indeed um, trying to, uh, I get a little leery, Paul, about having the word balance, um, you know, in terms of balancing security and privacy and so on. It's an incorporation of multiple elements uh, that are um, inherent in a complex society that we have today. Um, but so those are, those are my initial thoughts and, and then I only would end with saying that Although this is not an endorsement, I certainly think that the, the PCLOB would be a useful tool for us as privacy officers to interact with.